Hi everybody. Welcome back to my channel. This week's story is called Angel. Sometimes an angel needs an angel. I hope you enjoy. Let's begin. My dog died two weeks ago, just before Thanksgiving, and my chest still ached. I stared at his picture on my phone, half lab, half mutt, black with brown feet and brown tips on his ears. I was on my lunch break, and I took a walk in a nearby park to endure the heartache. A dim, cloudy day matched my mood perfectly. According to the forecast, we could expect a few snow flurries. Nice dog, a voice behind me said. What's his name? Sir growls a lot, I said, and turned around. The man was clean cut, a little under six feet, and had a nervous smile. I'd seen him somewhere. Do I know you? Probably not, he said. I've only been here a couple of weeks. Name's Brady. You? Van, I said. You seem familiar. And so did his cologne. A nice, crisp smell. Maybe you saw me somewhere, Brady said. Why do you look so sad? Not sure how much I wanted to share. I put my phone away. Sir Growls died. Brady gave me a bittersweet smile. I remember now. My first day on the job, you brought him in, but old age had caught up to the guy. He died on the table, Brady said. I'm sorry I couldn't do more than make him comfortable. You're the new vet at the Bunting Animal Clinic, I said. Graduated last June, Brady said. I always did have lousy timing. What do you mean? Brady walked alongside me, smiling a little. I've been working up the courage to ask if you could have lunch with me. And the day I do, you're not having a good day. You've been spying on me, I said, casually biting my lip to hide the smile. Brady said, not really. I came to the park the other day and saw you talking on your phone. I thought it might be nice to get to know you, get to know somebody. You're on lunch too? I took a seat on a bench. Brady sat next to me. This part of the park had a large field with a couple of guys kicking a soccer ball around. Some days it's kind of random. Some days I eat when I can, Brady said and ran his hands through his hair. I've only been here a couple of weeks, and I'm still trying to meet people. You? Still in college, I said. Journalism majors my morning. My afternoon is that store over there. Do you like helping animals? I do, Brady said. Are you interested in another dog? Once you've had a good friend like Sir Growls, I said. It's hard to be alone, Brady said. Come by after work today. I'll show you around. One of the guys kicked the soccer ball too hard, and it sailed to our bench, bounced, and I caught it. Sorry, the guy yelled. That's okay, I said, giving him a half smile and tossing the ball back. I turned back to Brady. Instead of lunch, what about dinner? You're on. Brady's smile lit up his face. There's a place in walking distance, Lupe's Grill. Best salsa in the state. I know the place, I said. 5.30? Make it 6, Brady said. Some people called and are bringing in a tough case. Oh? Abandoned dog that needs some help. Brady's phone buzzed and he checked his texts. He's here. I'll meet you at Lupe's. Then afterwards, I'll take you to our shelter and, and you can check out the dogs. I got to go. I pulled my phone out to set a reminder, but when I looked around... Brady had already gone. All afternoon, I thought about him, about our date. I had never gotten a phone number or a last name. I knew only where he worked. Dinner tonight would be one level above a blind date. Van, my boss said, pay attention. We have customers. I sat at the desk in the back where I had been untangling cardboard reindeers from Santa's sledge without breaking their little legs. I checked the time. Three hours until quitting time. Then my date, an hour after that. 
Van, get out here. Coming, I said, taking a few red Christmas baubles with me. On the way to the front, I placed them on the different racks. The store had already started its month-long marathon of old Christmas songs. I arrived at the cashier stand to find two gentlemen waiting. I helped them, and all afternoon, I was busier than usual as people came in looking for Christmas gifts. My phone beeped. Quitting time. But I had an hour to wait. I punched out, and instead of walking to the restaurant, I decided to visit the animal clinic. It had finally started to snow. Only an inch was on the lawns, and the roads were only wet. But it looked good. I pulled up to the Bunting Animal Clinic and walked inside. It smelled like dogs. How I missed that smell. And the air was filled with the sweet music of barking dogs. All kinds of barks. High ones, low ones, hoarse ones. Even little puppy yips. And more Christmas songs. No one sat at the front desk, except the cat. It stared at me, licking its paw, and giving me a big meow. Is this where I check in? I asked the cat. I got another meow. Somebody had started putting up a Christmas tree, but it stopped for some reason. A tree should never be left half naked. I walked past it, into the back, into the kennels, into heaven. Two corridors of chain-link rooms were partitioned off filled with all kinds of dogs. Bulldogs, pit bulls, chihuahuas, poodles, mutts, everything. They all wanted my attention. I wandered around, reaching in to touch a few noses, pet a few, scratch a few ears. Off to the side, they had a room where they kept a few dogs in isolation, marked private. I walked in, the door clicked shut behind me, and my heart broke. The isolation room only had one dog. Before me, on a silver table, a mid-sized dog lay on its side, covered in bandages. Its fur had been shaved off, one ear was half missing, and its front paw was in a cast. The skin was a mix of pink and red splotches, some covered in cream. The dog wore a cone collar to keep from biting itself. The tail wagged a little, but it had a kink in it where it must have been broken a long time ago. The dog lay on a couple of towels, with a third draped on top of it. This must be the tough case Brady mentioned. You poor baby, I said, and reached out to touch its side. The dog wagged its tail. I read the name on the file. Angel. A little boy duck. Hey, little angel. I took my phone out and took a video of it. You'll be up and running around in no time. The dog gave a little whine. Since nobody was around to stop me, I reached out and stroked the dog's head, tickled the ears, let it lick my hand. The tail wagged a little harder, making soft thumping sounds when it hit the table. I'll admit it. One look and I had fallen in love. Who claimed that first that love at first sight didn't happen? The dog needed help, a familiar voice said. It barely survived on the streets, and maybe now it has a chance to live. Listen, Brady, you're new here, said a stern female voice. We can't afford to treat every creature brought to our door, and we don't have the budget for this one. I want you to put it to sleep so we don't waste any more money. No, Brady said. Angel needs a little time, and we can find him a home. Don't be a bleeding heart. This isn't a no-kill shelter. You can be replaced if you don't get with the program. You're so worried about money, Brady said, his voice stiff and cold. An anonymous donor saw the dog and brought in, the dog brought in, and already donated to pay for his care. You and your precious budget won't have to pay a thing. I'm going to check on our angel. We already have too many animals, the director said. The door clicked open behind me, and Brady entered wearing a lab coat. Both hands had clenched into fists, and though he frowned, he took one look at me, 
and smiled. Van, what are you doing here? We are not done with this conversation. I don't care who recommended you. You, the director of the clinic, followed Brady and saw me. This is a restricted area. I have a tendency to open my mouth and make stuff up as I go. I get my best ideas that way. I raised my phone and continued recording. Van Wilson, journalism major. I'm writing a story about veterinary clinics and the people who staff them. Van, Brady said. I heard about this dog, and I thought I would focus the article on its care, treatment, and recovery, I said. Could you clarify the statement that you want to euthanize any animal brought to you for help, including this one? You're a reporter, the director said. From what I heard, you will fire anyone who treats an injured animal instead of killing it, correct? You're taking this out of context. I don't think so, I said. Could you answer the question, please? Please note that I am recording, and I have recorded your earlier statement, which I will be using in my article. The director folded her arms and took a step back. She looked at Brady as if for help, but he folded his arms too. It's not that we won't help, she said. We can't afford it. Even though you have an anonymous donor willing to pay for Angel's care, you still plan on disposing of the dog? The director paused to take a breath. I guess that would be pointless. But you have to understand, that's only one dog, the director said. What about the next one? Who will pay for that? If I understand you, if you had money coming in, you could help more animals, I asked. That's the world we live in. If you have money, you make the rules, the director said. When you write the article, I want to see it. If you have any ideas for making money fall out of the sky, tell me, if you'll excuse me. As she left, Brady leaned over Angel and checked the bandages. The way you made my boss back down, I could kiss you. What are you doing here? I didn't think we met until six. Are you really writing an article? I am now, I said, smiling. I had some free time, so I came to look at the dogs. What's Angel's story? We believe Angel's two years old, a border collie and cocker spaniel mix. He's neutered and chipped, Brady sighed. One of the most hyper and friendliest dogs I've met. But he isn't right now. We sedated him. Chipped. You couldn't find the owner? We did. The owner moved a year ago and left the dog on the streets, Brady said, and ran a hand along the dog. The little guy developed a bad case of mange, had a poorly healed broken leg, a lot of open sores, and ticks all over his body. We got him cleaned up and he's on antibiotics and painkillers right now. Poor thing, I said. How can I help him? You already did. I think you just saved his life. Brady took off his lab coat and reached out to the dog, gently holding one of the paws. His medical bills are not cheap. And you heard, we don't have a budget for charity work. I guess Angel's going to be here a while? Two weeks at least. If I help pay for his bills, can I adopt him? I asked. Normally, I'd say yes, Brady said. But somebody else has already filled out the paperwork. I kept my face from showing my disappointment, but I lowered my eyes back to Angel and held another of his paws. I'd still like to help out. Do you think they'd mind? My hand was only inches from Brady's. Brady bit his lip and his eyes twinkled. You'd have to ask him. Maybe tonight, at dinner? I like this guy already. I'll do that, but I'm going to need a lot more information for the article. Like what? Brady said. I can bring the files with me. Your name and phone number, I said. I might have just rescued two lost souls. I took Brady's hand and pulled him along. He didn't pull away. Did you know Lupe's has a dance floor? Three weeks later, Christmas Eve, I brought a large chew bone and a bottle of wine to Brady's home. We were celebrating. Angel finally left Bunting to go to his forever home with Brady, just in time for Christmas. 
and a snowstorm, of course. I had come to see the dog every day, and Brady and I had lunch every day. He lived in a three-bedroom bungalow with a large fenced-off yard, now snow-covered. The article had turned into a series of videos called Lost Cause, which we posted on YouTube. It was about tragic animals brought in for medical help and what the staff at Bunting had done to care for them. Even the director had gotten on board and made some great suggestions. At the end of each video, we pleaded our case and requested any help people could send. Angel was our first case, and tonight he is our first success story. The donations were already coming in, including an assortment of dog toys donated by a local pet store. Last week, another dog came in, but his care was already paid for. A family from Utah wanted to give him a forever home. When I arrived at Brady's, I let myself in the gate, pulled my new camera out, and started filming. Brady had decorated his house with blinking lights, a wreath on the door, and he displayed a Christmas tree in the window. Angel snuffed at an old shrub, and when he saw me, he wagged his crooked tail, ran through the snow, and jumped on me to say hello. I knelt, brushed the snow off him, and gave him a good rub down. He responded by jumping up and planting a huge saliva-filled lick across my mouth. As I wiped my mouth, he ran and found a braided rope, grabbed it, and shook it ferociously. Brady sat on the steps, smiling. I tossed the bone to the angel and gave Brady the wine before shutting out the camera. I sat beside him and gave him a quick kiss. We'd grown close over the last few weeks. Angel let go of the rope and chased after the chew bone. I've been thinking, Brady said. Angel has too much energy. It's going to be a two-person job keeping up with him. Do you want to be his other dad? What are the benefits? I flirted. I'm sure there's something. Brady held out a small package and suppressed a smile. You won't have to worry about your upstairs neighbor's plumbing going bad. I took the package and opened it. A ring box with a key inside. I said, does this mean? It means. This time, Brady kissed me. Merry Christmas. He held my hand and we watched our angel toss the chew bone in the air. The angel that had brought us together 